At about one o'clock the next day, the pilot came aboard and we stood by, ready to leave harbor. A few friends waved from the jetty as we pushed off, and some of the boys on the forecastle waved farewell to Greenock, scene of many good runs ashore. Soon we had dropped the pilot and were on the first stage of the three-day trip to our weather station, 600 miles out in the Atlantic. Next morning, we were off the northwest coast of Ireland, our last sight of land for a month. The first member of the ship's company to regard the Atlantic swell with mixed feelings was Nimbus, the ship's cat. Dear me, poor old Nimbus. On the way out, the weather was fairly good by Atlantic standards, and after three days, we reached our station. I for item, A position, 60 degrees north, 20 degrees west. To you and David, that meant being 600 miles out and 200 miles south of Iceland, where the deep depressions come from. It's just one of the 13 weather reporting stations planned for the North Atlantic. Before the Ocean Weather Service started, Observations were made only by ships and aircraft on the normal trade routes, and these still go on, of course. To cover the blank areas and provide more accurate forecasts, eight nations have got together and fitted out ships as floating MET stations. So here's one international agreement that really does work. The Atlantic was kind to us for the first few days, and the Met assistants made their observations in good weather. First, the sea temperature is taken. The movement of warm and cold currents affect the weather a good deal. The Met assistant heaves a canvas bucket over the side and collects a sample of seawater, and then takes its temperature. When the ship's rolling, this is quite a difficult business, but our boys are well used to it. Jock's an ex-engineer and TT rider, for instance, and we've got some lads from the RAF on the Met staff. Next, the air temperature from the roof of the wheelhouse is recorded. Then he observes the visibility using an instrument called a loofah. And it's nothing like the loofah that David uses in the bath either. Afterwards, he has a talk with the officer of the watch about sea and sky conditions in general. And finally, to complete the job, he goes down to the Met plotting office and reads the barometer. Meanwhile, in the balloon shed on deck, the balloon is being prepared for the afternoon ascent. We send up one balloon every six hours, the whole time we're on station. The balloons are filled with hydrogen, and some of them go up as far as 70,000 feet before they burst. Their course and their speed are plotted all the way by radar. Down in the Met office, one of the tiny transmitters carried by each balloon is tested.
Instruments on the transmitter record changes in air conditions as the balloon rises, and these readings are automatically sent out and picked up by a receiver in the ship. After the transmitter is fixed to the balloon comes the tricky business of launching. I suppose this part of our job would appeal to young David, though he'd find it rather difficult setting off one of our balloons from the back lawn. Luckily, at the time of my first launch, there wasn't much of a sea running and everything went off smoothly. The officer of the watch follows the course of the balloon for the first few seconds and passes its bearing to the radar room below until it's high enough to be picked up by the radar set. <laughs> 